Would you like to turn your Bibles to James chapter 5? We're going to close the series. We're going to, you know, end the series um, real mature uh, with this Sunday. We've looked at um, five different uh, marks of a mature person as James proposes them throughout his book. From chapter 1 to chapter 5, in each chapter, he points out how does a mature Christian look like? You could be a Christian for a long time, but not mature at all. And these are the signs um, that show whether you are a mature Christian or not. In chapter 1, he says a mature person is positive under pressure. A mature Christian is positive under pressure. Uh, number 2, in chapter 2, we looked at um, a mature Christian as being somebody who is sensitive to people. That he understands what kind of people around him, he is sensitive towards them, he, um, uh, he treats them with the love of Christ. And that's why in chapter 2 he says, you would, you would be a perfect man if you complete the royal law. What is the royal law? Love your neighbor as yourself. That's a royal law. If you can actually do it in your life, you will be a perfect man. That's what he says in chapter 2. In chapter 3, he talked about another sign of a mature person. Uh, the sign of a mature person in chapter 3 is he is the master of his tongue. If you know how to control your tongue, you will avoid a lot of problems in your life. That's the whole discussion in chapter 3. In fact, James talks about controlling your tongue so much that um, all, almost every single chapter in the book of James, he touches the aspect of tongue. Um, tongue destroys our relationships. Tongue can build people up. Uh, so you can either use it to destroy your own life, destroy people around you, or you can use your tongue to build people up and encourage them. So um, as a Christian, I must be a person who controls, who is, un, uh, you know, his tongue, who brings his tongue under control. Number four, last week we looked at the fourth uh, mark of a mature person uh, from chapter four. Um, a mature, mark of a mature person is he is a peacekeeper. He knows how to avoid conflicts. He knows how to resolve conflicts within his relationships. Um, conflicts are a natural part of our lives, of every relationship. Any relationship will have some kind of conflict, some kind of tension in it. But a mature person knows how to diffuse a conflict in his life. We talked about it last week, but, uh, Brother Andrew uh, talked about uh, how do we um, control uh, our selfish desires in order to reduce conflicts in our lives. We look at chapter 5 now, and we will look at the fifth mark of a mature person. Verses uh, 7 onwards. I want to read verses 7 onwards. Chapter 5 is such a huge treasury um, to talk about. Um, there are so many things I could teach you from chapter 5. Um, but since we are talking only about the signs of a mature person, I'm just picking up one um, area from chapter 5. Chapter 5, verses 7. Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmer who patiently waits uh, for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. For examples of patience and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance. You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end, for the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. But most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or earth or anything else, just say a simple yes or no, so that you will not sin and be condemned. In verses, from verses 7 to 12, James talks about the fifth sign of a mature Christian. The fifth sign of a mature Christian, he 
has enduring patience. He has enduring patience. A lot of us, a, a, a lot of our life, we spend waiting. As a little kid, I waited all my life to get into the school. Then I couldn't wait until I got out from the school and get into the college. Then I couldn't wait to fall in love and then couldn't wait to get married, couldn't wait to have children. Now I wish I had waited. Uh, not, not because of my children, I wish I had taken a little more time. We spend a lot of our life waiting. There are many things in our lives that test our patience, like Hyderabadi roads, like the supermarket lines, like the um, waiting room at the doctor's office, or the people who are beside us who it seems as if they never stop speaking, you know, they speak never ending. They test our patience a lot. We hate to wait. We, we are the now generation. We want everything to happen now, instantly, immediately. Uh, I, I'm a very patient man, except when I'm hungry. Um, then I lose my character. Have you noticed, the more expensive the restaurant is, the longer you get to wait. You have to wait to get a table. Then you have to wait to get the menu. Then you have to wait uh, to, get, to give the order. And then you have to wait for the food to come back. And then you have to wait even for the bill. And they have the audacity to call the guy, the other guy, the waiter. We are the ones who are actually waiting here. A 19th century preacher uh, by the name of A.B. Simpson says this. Beloved, have you ever thought that someday you will not have anything to try you? Or anyone to vex you again? There will be no opportunity in heaven to learn or to show the spirit of patience. There will never be an opportunity in heaven to show the spirit of forbearance uh, 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 or long suffering. If you, are, if you are to practice these things, it has to be on the earth right now, here while you are living. You need, we need patience in every area of our lives. In this passage, in James chapter 5, James uses the word patience or perseverance at least six times. And he uses three different illustrations to make his point on, on when we need to be patient, why we need to be patient, how should we be patient. So I'm going to explore those areas today. When do we need to be patient, why we need to be patient, and how do we need to be patient. Is that okay? All right, if you're taking notes, you, you, if you already have your notes in your hand, start taking. If you don't have a notes, start taking the notes. You still need to take the notes. Uh, this is going to help you, and you need it. Real maturity is to develop and exhibit patience. Remember that. Real maturity is to develop and exhibit patience. Number one, when should we be patient? When should I be patient? Using three illustrations, James portrays to us three kind of circumstances when we need to be patient. Now, he's not asking us to be patient uh, all the time. It would be foolish for us if I'm running 102 temperature for more than two days to continue to wait patiently. That would be foolish for me without, you know, I have to go and get to see the doctor. Uh, if it would be foolish for me that um, if I'm standing in the middle of a road and I see a truck coming at 100 kilometer speed at me uh, and, and wait patiently for it to move the other side would be foolish. That, that, that's not what I'm asking you to do. That's definitely not what James is asking us to do. But at least he tells us three times when we need to be patient. Number one, when our circumstances are uncontrollable, be patient. When our circumstances are uncontrollable, be patient. Have you ever figured out that life is beyond your control? I hope you did. You're smart guys. Life is beyond our control. So James uses farmer as an example of how life is beyond our control. Where circumstances are beyond, beyond our control. In verse 7 he says, be patient my brothers and sisters until the Lord's coming. 
See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is. What is he saying? He's saying if you want to be a farmer, you've got to have a lot of patience. Don't be a farmer if you don't have patience. Part of the job description of a farmer is that he has to do a lot of waiting. He has to wait for the right time to till, wait for the right time to plant, wait for the right, right time to prune, wait. There are a lot of factors in waiting. He has to wait um, uh, uh, for, the, for the rain to come, the weather, the rain, the heat, the economy, the labor, uh, uh, the, pri the market prices, everything after that, after he sows the seed, is beyond his control. There's nothing else he can do. He waits a long time, he works hard, plants the seed, and then he has to wait. Wait uh, for the, sick things, the, the circumstances to fall in the right place, which basically are beyond his control. We deal with a lot of uncontrollable factors in our lives, circumstances in our life. Have you noticed um, that even when we realize that our situation right now in our life is beyond our control, we still try to control it. We still try to use our logic and our, our reasoning and try and control it. We, how do we do that? By worrying. By worrying a lot about uh, what's happening in our lives, what's happening around us, and uh, thinking a lot of time, uh, uh, you know, most of our, our nights are spent in thinking uh, and worrying about a situation at your office, worrying about a situation at your home, worrying about a situation uh, in, your you know, in, the, in the economy, um, things that are beyond your control. To worry about something that you can change is dumb. But to worry about something that you can't change it's foolish. It's useless. Either you shouldn't worry or um, you should wait um, for the things to change, circumstances to change. We need to have patience when the things, circumstances are uncontrollable in our lives. That's in one area. Number two, the second area where we need to be patient is this, that when people are unchangeable, when people are unchangeable. Now, I want you to know this very carefully, and I understand this. Being a pastor for the last 12 years and watching hundreds of people coming and going in the church, people don't like change. It's a fact. Especially if you are a leader, if you are somebody who's heading another team, you know what I'm talking about. People don't like change. We like routine, we like mundane, we like what is predictable, we like what is under control, we like what is comfortable, that's what we are. We naturally don't like change. That's, that's understandable. It is hard for people to ch accept change and move into a new direction. And it's, uh, it's, it's natural to happen like that. And because of that, it becomes very difficult for people to change their character, their habits, their behavior pattern. So you need to be patient when people are unchangeable. James gives an example of the prophets. First he uses the prom prof farmer, now he uses another example through prophets. As an example of patience in the suffering, take prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Why did he talk about prophets? You see, the duty of prophets was help people to change. Show them the new direction. Show them where God wants them to go. Or bring them back from their ways, that wayward ways, back into the right, right way to God. To be different in their behavior. And people would resist that. They don't like when a prophet stands up and tells them, you got to change your ways. They get mad at a prophet who asks them to change their lifestyle, who asks them to change their behavior patterns. And that's why they made prophets suffer. So, James is telling us, look at the prophets. Even though they are trying to help people, 
they had to suffer under people but yet they waited patiently even when people are unchangeable imagine if ezekiel had given up on people imagine if jeremiah had given up on people the worst possible um, circumstances that were faced by a prophet was in the life of jeremiah the worst thing is this that jeremiah lived before the people of israel were taken as captives and he prophesied about being they being taken as captives um, uh, to babylon and he begged them to change their ways so that god can stop that from happening people did not they in fact persecuted him so not only he suffered um, um, for prophesying about a future that is coming then he himself had to endure through that exile and live through the exile uh, imagine the kind of pain he had to go through and yet he waited patiently for god to work in their lives do you have anybody in your life right now who refuses to change do you know how difficult it is uh, to live with that kind of person i know uh, i know you you you're going to look at me and ask me the same question do you know how difficult it is for us to live with that kind of person so we need patience with those kind of people an author called joyce lander calls them as irregular people why they are irregular people because they these are people who see only their way not anybody else's perspective they never change they don't want to change they may never change so what are you going to do about it james says be patient um the word patience in greek there um is called makrothumos it's a combination of two words two base words macro means you know long right big thumos means heat um you know in um, in translation that's where we get the word thermometer from macro thumos is saying this when he's asking us to be patient he's saying take long time to get hot take long time to get angry that is what he's asking us to do you got to have a long fuse you don't blow up quickly you don't get overheated with people uh, if you're going to be if you want to be successful with people you got to learn to be patient with them if you want to be successful parent and i'm talking to myself by the way i've got to have a long fuse i'm getting to know that now you don't get overheated you don't get uh, angry quickly that's number 2 number 3 um number 1 when circumstances are uncontrollable when uh, number 2 when people are unchangeable number 3 when problems are unexplainable when problems are unexplainable he uses a third example in the form of a guy called job if there was one guy who suffered the most in the scriptures as we see that and some of us could be there in 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 the place of job verse 11 he says have you heard of job's perseverance if there was a champions league for suffering i think job would have won the championship i mean he would be the guy who, who would hold that trophy suffering um he was the wealthiest man ever lived he had everything going for him in a two day period everything fell apart the empire that he built for himself has come down he went bankrupt his children were murdered uh, he got an incurable deadly disease that was very painful and you, you know you you think you got problems he's got a rough day in one single day he lost everything that he owned his children died um, and he's got this this disease that he doesn't know what to do about it then worst is this that his own wife walked up to him and said why don't you die man if there was you know i i guess were you know worse than the incurable disease those words would have hurt him i mean really hurt him deeply when his wife told him why don't you die he was suffering materially physically socially in every kind of way uh, 
The worst part of Job's suffering is that he has absolutely no idea why he's suffering. In fact, all through the book of Job, he kept asking that question, I'm okay to suffer, I need to know why I'm suffering. I'm okay to go through what I'm going through. This pain is unbearable. I will take the pain. No problem. But just tell me why I'm going through the pain. Some of you could be there today. You are okay to take the pain. You're okay to take setbacks. You're okay to take failure. But you don't understand why you're going through what you're going through. No apparent reason. I mean... Of all the people, I guess only Job had the privilege to say, why me, God? Life is not fair, and this is true. I keep telling this from this pulpit. Life on the earth is not fair. Bible never said, God never said life would be fair on the earth. A lot of things in our life doesn't make sense. You see, maybe... We will never understand on this side of eternity till we get into heaven why we are suffering at this point of time. Job didn't understand. But in all of those unexplained problems, there was one thing that Job did and one thing that we need to learn is this, that Job maintained his faith in God. Job maintained his faith in God. I know life is unfair, I know I've got un unexplained problems, but I do know God is good. I do know God is good. And he maintained that. He never lost the sight of a righteous, benevolent God. But we lose sight very quickly, isn't it, when we have unexplainable problems in our lives. Sometimes we just can't figure out our problems, but yet, that is the time we need to be patient. When circumstances are uncontrollable, when people are unchangeable, when problems are unexplainable, is the time we really need to be patient. That's number one. Number two, why should I be patient? That's another question that we need to answer. When should I be patient? We, logged, we talked about it. Why should I be patient? I'll give you three reasons again from the three examples. Number one, because God is in control. You need to be patient because God is the boss. That God is in control. Be patient and stand firm, he says, in verses 8. Because the Lord's coming is near. I know the verse may sound uh, like as if he's talking about the second coming. And of course he's talking about the second coming. But there is an underlying message James is sending to all of us. Hey, listen. Listen. Everything that God does is with absolute certainty. God knows what he's doing. That's what he's trying to tell us. He's got everything under his control. In uh, Philip's, J.B. Phillips' translation, the same verse, uh, he says, rest your hearts on the ultimate certainty that God is coming back. So, James is telling all of us this, that God is the in charge of history, that God is the in charge of your relationship, that God is in charge of your job, that God is in charge of the economy, that God is in charge of our country, that God is in charge of this church. He knows what he's doing. He's in control of history because of course it is his story. He's got everything planned out. Everything is on schedule. Everything is on schedule. Nothing is late. Nothing is out of, your con uh, out of control. Everything is moving towards a climax. God's purpose for your life is greater than any problem you're facing right now. And because he's got a purpose for your life, and because... His purpose for your life is greater than your problems at this point of time. You need to be assured of this fact. That because I am in his purpose, he knows how to do, how to end my story. 
God is in control. Give God time. Even when the knife flashes in the air, the ram will be seen caught in a thicket. Give God time. Even when Pharaoh's host of army is on Israel's heels, a path through the waters will suddenly be opened. Give God time. Even when the bed of brook is dry, Elijah will hear a guiding voice through that. Because God is in control, I need to be patient. Number two, because God rewards patience, I need to be patient. In verses 11, first part of verses 11, as you know, he says, we consider blessed are those who have persevered. Circle the word blessed, you know, if, you're, if you have your Bibles and you, you're okay to write on your Bible, circle the word blessed. The second half of Job's life is better than the first half of Job's life. You may think the first half was great. He was the wealthiest man on the earth. He's got children, good enough children, who can take care of his empire. Uh, he's got everything going on for him and he lost everything. And you think worst has happened to him. But look at his second half. It pays to be patient. There are all kinds of rewards. Your character grows. You get along with people better. You are happier. You reach your goals. And you are honored by others. Not just on the other side of eternity. You will be blessed even on this side of the eternity. So when people put you down, put you down, when they criticize you, be patient. Because that, there's going to be a reward in heaven and here on the earth. Both. See, it's our natural tendency to get back at people. Become vengeful. Retaliate. But that's the opposite of the patience. So, um, James is teaching us, hey, be patient because the reward is better. God um, has rewards in waiting for us if you're patient. Number three, the reason why we need to wait is because God is working things out. God is working things out. Often behind the things, things we don't see, God is at work. Just because you don't see him at work doesn't mean he's not at work. Just because I can't see things changing with my eyes at this point of time, just because I think the time is moving too fast and things should have happened long back doesn't mean God is not working behind. God is always working behind us. Always course correcting us. Always to make sure that our lives would be better than yesterday. The same verses, verses 11, second part of verses 11. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord he is full of compassion and mercy. Remember, God is working. He was working in Job's life behind the screen. Job didn't know what's going on. Job didn't know why things are happening in his life. He has no clue. But that doesn't mean God was not in charge and God was not working things out. He was working things out. So in case of a delay in your life, don't think it's a denial from God. Delay does not necessarily mean a denial. God is at work. Even when we see, when we don't see, and we question, why, why is this happening to me? Uh, God is working. You know, we are like this pastor who was, um, I mean, actually, I could be the same guy, uh, who, who was walking uh, impatiently in his, in his office and... Um, from one side to the other side, and a member walked up to him and asked him, hey, uh, what's the matter, pastor? And he said, I'm in a hurry, but God is not. 
we're always in a hurry and we feel that god is not in a hurry to get the things done you know trust me last two months have been like that for me i'm in a hurry for things to happen god is like absolutely but here is what i've learned while i'm waiting god is working and you need to remember that your hands may be tied your situation may be uncontrollable but it is not uncontrollable from god's view point in advance actually you should thank god for doing his work behind us a farmer plants the seed and he's waiting for that seed to sprout it's not in his hand he can't see it happening but god is working god is working behind the scenes because he is the one who's going to cause the seed to sprout he is the one who will create con- right conditions at the right time for the seed to sprout and for it to grow and bring a harvest so just as a farmer waits you and i need to learn to wait because god is at work in your relationship in your finances with your boss god is at work in fact god is at work within you in philippians chapter 2 verses 13 paul says god is at work within you maybe you can't see it but it is true god is at work within you if you are a child of god trust me god is at work within you you see it could be possible that we are not the ones who are ready to receive god's blessing i'll come to that a little later because we are not yet ready so be patient i don't know what kind of problem you have this week what kind of problem you're going to face tomorrow morning i don't know how big this is going to look like it's going to be it's going to look like how tough it may look like now regardless of the problem that you're facing you're going to face tomorrow financial relational health i want you to know that god is working in that problem so be patient and trust him so when should i be patient we looked at why should i be patient let's look at how should i be patient from the same three illustrations let's look at how should i be patient the word wait is a crucial thing in order to develop patience we need to learn to wait in those three illustrations he teaches us on how to wait number 1 wait expectantly wait expectantly as a farmer who is tilling the soil and sowing the seed you will not be able to do those things unless you expect the seed to sprout and a harvest to come just because you don't see rain just because you don't see monsoons change a change in monsoon and weather um you don't till the soil and and, and sow the seed right you you actually go ahead and do it before uh weather changes before monsoon comes you see it is inevitable to develop patience um without waiting expectantly so what does the farmer do while he is waiting on god just sit and sit in his couch and watch the reruns on television or netflix he's not going to sit quiet right he's going to work because he expects that i need to put in some work before i expect to see a result while i'm waiting you're preparing while you're waiting you're preparing for the answer to come that's called waiting expectantly waiting is the time for preparation which shows that you are expecting we demonstrate our expectation by our preparation remember that we get ready for answer in advance psalm 130 verses 5 the psalm is says i wait expectantly trusting god to help for all that he has promised 
So the word expectantly means that I am waiting for God. While I'm waiting for God, I'm also getting ready for God to answer my prayer. You see, maybe you, you want God to heal a long-term disease. Maybe you want God to transform your marriage. Maybe you want uh, God to reverse your financial situation, financial problems. Maybe you want for God to reach out to your friends and your family. And you are praying for it. You have been praying for it. But do you really expect God to do that? I can give a guarantee that most of us don't actually expect that to happen. You see, Bible says, according to your faith, it will be done to you. So, do you have an expectancy? That's number one. Let me just um, uh, give you one more verse and then go to, go to the second point. Isaiah chapter 49, verse 23. The Lord says, No one who waits for my help will be disappointed. No one who waits for my help will be disappointed. Do you have that kind of expectations? You know, it could be possible that while you think I'm waiting on God, it could be possible that He's the one who's really waiting on you. He may really want to do something in your life. He may really want to do something in your relationship. Long time ago, but maybe you are not in a position to receive it because of your unbelief, because you're not... Uh, um, ready to receive it. He's like, I want to do that, man. I want to pour out my blessing into your life. The problem is your hands are not prepared for it. You're not even like this, expecting me to do something in your life. So I, I, obviously I cannot do. So wait expectantly, number two, wait quietly. Wait quietly. So James points out the fact that we have a tendency to run off our mouth when we are waiting. You see, usually when we are irritated, when we are tense, when we are under pressure, when things aren't going our way, things are not under our control, we don't keep our mouth under control. He talks about two in situations. Don't grumble against each other, brothers. Or you'll be judged. Look at the judge who's standing there, he says. Why does he talk about grumbling in the middle of a sermon on patience? Because that's what we do. When we are frustrated, it's quite hard to be quiet. If we want everybody to know it, know about what we are, what's happening in our life, we want to grumble, we want to mumble, we want to mourn, we want to complain. We don't mind waiting, but if we can complain about it, it'll be good. It'll be a stress reliever for us. So, uh, he, in a New English Bible translation of the same verse says, don't blame your troubles on one another, he says. When you get up in the morning, do you rise and whine? Arise and shine. Not the W-I-N-E, huh? W-H-I-N-E. Everything, you know, you, 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 even, even from your bed, you start off saying, everything is bad. The day is going to be bad. Things are not in the right place. And then you come home late in the night, dog tired. One of the reasons why we are dog tired is because we have been barking all the day. And James is saying, don't do that. Wait quietly. Number two, the second way we, uh, uh, you know, we use, we run off our mouth is, um, verses 12, he says, above all, my brothers, don't swear. He says, don't swear. First of all, you'll grumble. Second, if you're too bitter, you'll start swearing. You know, does waiting ever tempt you to swear? Sometimes when we get frustrated, we feel like cursing, you know. So what happens when you get uptight? When you're frustrated, when things aren't going the way you want them to go, things are beyond your control. How do you normally respond to it? Typically, we take out our frustration on those who are closest to us. 
and we use really the harshest word harshest words possible we unload everything on our, our wives or husbands or children and it's not even their fault you know when you display your anger and focus it on those you love the most you are destroying your own relationships james says don't do that impatience with god leads to impatience with people impatience with god leads to impatience with people so wait quietly let me read one verse and then we'll move to the last one habakkuk chapter 2 verses 3 these things won't happen right away you know verses 2 verses 1 and 2 he says i'm going to do this 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 but i want you to know this these things don't happen right away slowly steadily surely the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled if it seems slow don't be, do not be despair for these things will surely come to pass just be patient they will not be overdue by a single day what god is saying is i'll get everything done on time not a day more not a day less but on time i'll get the job done you be patient so do you have a dream or a goal in life a vision that god said god's given to you god is saying it'll be right on target it is right on target it'll come happen at the right time on the right day in the right way number 3 uh, wait confidently wait confidently wait expectantly uh, wait with expectancy wait quietly and wait confidently job never lost his confidence in all that is happening in his life even among all the things that is happening in his life when the outlook is bad learn to look up you'll start learning to have faith you see we tend to look around rather than looking up we may look up for a brief period but then when things don't seem like changing we immediately start looking all around us for help for things to change um or take things matters into our own hands and try to do things on our own hands with our own hands and then mess up worse i mean the situation becomes worse than what it was before um hope somebody tra- hope the word hope somebody mm, expanded it this way holding on praying expectantly holding on praying expectantly you got a problem that is unexplainable you got a person that is unchangeable you got a circumstance that is uncontrollable wait confidently god is working have that faith psalm 37 verse 7 be still before god and wait patiently for him to act you see we are okay to be still in the sight of god in the presence of god but when 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 it looks like god is not acting we want to take the action we want to move forward we want to do something and and the psalmist is teaching us this wait patiently for god to act so um, in those situations problems are unexplainable people are unchangeable circumstances uncontrollable wait for god to take the action because you can't do anything anyway and even if you do that you'll mess it up so where do you need patience this morning do you have an uncontrollable circumstance in your life right now do you have an unchangeable person um in uh, your relationships do you have a long term illness in in your body it's frustrating i understand that and you want to make things happen quickly everything has to happen right now you you know chances are it could be possible that you are willing to change but the people you are waiting on are not willing to change and that's worse 
um, remember God is working in them just as he's working in you wait patiently you see anything could be out of my control but it's never out of God's control if there is nothing to endure obviously you cannot learn to be patient and that's why in order to teach us to be patient God allows us to go through things that test our patience you see satan wants us to get impatient with god he wants us to make impatient christians you see because an impatient christian is a powerful tool in the hand of satan remember that an impatient christian is a powerful tool in the hand of satan it could be possible that you're playing right into the hands of satan by becoming impatient with god and he will use you my friend powerfully to destroy everybody around you including your own life moses impatience cost him his entrance into holy land abraham's impatience gave birth to ishmael and because of that the world is at war even today peter's impatience almost turned him into a murderer what did your impatience cost you think about it learn from uh, james to wait expectantly to wait quietly and to wait confidently if you need the help of god he is willing to do that he is willing to give you um, the spirit of god who would bring forth that fruit of uh, of the spirit which also has uh, patience would you close your eyes at this point of time um you see god is glorified when we are purified through our suffering and that's only possible if you are willing to wait for god